My name is Marcus Brown, and today we are going to go through a project from start to finish. Specifically, we're going to do this part right here. So the kind of the premise that we're going to follow is that we landed this job and it's, you know, big money. It's great opportunity for the shop with a new customer. But the problem is it, it, it has some difficulties. So the part itself is in the communication sector. It's a radar mount, so it has a lot of tight tolerances that we have to deal with. Um, there's a lot of really thin features. In some cases, almost you know, silly thin. Um, and so we have to be aware of that. Uh, it's got an unsupported span, right? It's got these feet that you can kind of clamp onto for uh, fixturing but then there's gonna be that open space in the middle. And then on the left-hand side, there's kind of an open loop over there that we're gonna to have to keep an eye on. There's a lot of complex curvature to it, and they want it quickly, meaning we need to work on making sure we don't have any delays to build this part. So all that said, probably the first thing we need to do is sit down and plan this thing out. Now. This thing's about 13 inches long, six inches wide. Um, it's not exactly clear how big this thing is. And depending on, you know, your background, depending on the people that are involved in the process, you may look at this, right, a 3D model or a 2D print and say, I, I get it, but I, I'm not really sure. And when the first one rolls off the line, they say, oh, well, yeah, now I get it. Uh, now I understand it better. You know, I'm a kind of visual, tactile person. Um, I would have done it differently had I known that, you know, at the beginning. So what I want to do is avoid that as much as possible. I want to eliminate any sort of hindsight problems where we could have saved a lot of time had we simply known what the part sort of looked like, felt like, etc. So for this, we're going to actually print a prototype. We're going to use our new partner, Form Labs. And we're going to print this thing on the 3L, the SLA uh, printer from Formlabs. So SLA printers basically go through and, and use a resin uh, to, to print it up using lasers. So this what this looks like is you just have you know your 3D model and it creates supports automatically. Just tell it kind of what orientation you want to put it in. That'll load it over to the machine where it's going to kind of print layer by layer. This is sped up video here. Um, but that part then just uh, gets washed, right? Just wash off all the extra uh, material, take it off the build plate and do a final cure. It kind of looks like you throw it in the oven for uh, the microwave, you know, makes the popcorn. But that part, when it's done, looks like this. So now that you have it in your hands, now that you can look at it, it really changes the conversation that you have. And this printed, this was a couple, well, under a couple hundred dollars, hundred and something dollars, and took like 20 hours to print. So SLA is a great uh, technology for really fast, high quality parts. For this, we use draft resin, so it printed really quickly, four times faster than the other resins typically do. Um, and we now see just how bad some of these thin features are. In fact, we were kind of passing it around at the meeting and somebody poked their finger through the uh the the opening here on this part is so thin that on this opaque plastic it's translucent uh, but you can see these holes are really close to the edge uh, this guy is kind of floating around here in the middle so with this we can really understand a lot of the challenges and decide how we want to approach them before we spend the time sort of doing it the hard way iterating out on the machine and stuff like that so um, we've got different concerns. Everybody, we pull everybody into the, the, the meeting that we can, right? We've got manufacturing, we've got some engineers, we've got uh, uh, the machinists themselves. Quality needs to be in the loop so that we can get this thing ready so there's no delays as it's going down the line. So the first thing I want to do is just start programming this, right? So the uh, machine group setup uh, is a great way to kind of start your project in Mastercam and start programming everything. It, the machine group setup isn't brand new. It was uh, introduced last year and the information contained in it isn't crazy new. Uh, this all was just in separate dialogues in the past. 
So this one dialogue, you can very quickly go through from start to finish everything you need. So first thing is the machine. Make sure the definition uh, for the machine is there. The control is, uh, is set up. The post processor is right. Uh, go down to the next list item, and you get the master model. This is just what we're going to be machining against. Um, then we can go look at the stock setup. If you didn't set up the stock ahead of time, you can grab it using wireframe geometry or you can create kind of a best fit cylinder or rectangular stock and kind of add a little bit if you need. Um, but for this one, we did go ahead and do a little bit of pre-work. We built a block that represents our stock based on what we know we can get and then used that to position these vices. Uh, so we're looking pretty good there. Uh, it does go ahead and show you the volume and the weight. If you've got the density, it shows you the weight. Uh, so you can kind of make sure you're on the right path. For the fixtures, um, I can grab them in the graphics area, but I've already got them organized on a level, just making it really easy to, to define those. Um, tools. Uh, this project already has some tools in it. Obviously, if we need to add some more, or maybe we have a standard tool set we use, we can go grab those. This is going to define how the tools are numbered, um, how we're pulling in the feed calculation, uh, just about anything you'd need to specify right ahead of time just to get ready to, to do the rest. And then finally we got the simulation. This is just going to be cut on a VMC and we'll specify what kind of stock we're using here. This, If you want to verify an intermediate operation uh, like maybe the second operation or one of the finishing operations, you could do that stock override there. But the machine group setup, it's it's really simple. It just puts everything in one place. So with Mastercam 2024, if you go find something and you expect it to be a standalone dialog, you may find that it's now in the machine group setup. So now I'm going to start uh, removing material. I'm going to use a high-speed toolpath for that. And with a high-speed toolpath and certain cutters that I get, they really like to run at a certain uh, configuration, right? Certain amount of engagement, feeds and speeds, uh, different step downs depending on how much my machine can handle. So I'm going to create a high-speed toolpath that just kind of machines this top level down to uh, the kind of the bottom or the, the the bottom of those tabs there. And for the parameters in this toolpath. This is just a standard brand new blank toolpath. I didn't go import. Usually I would, I would go and import an operation and then just chain it uh, to the geometry I want and it would have everything set. But as it stands, my default values out of the box, they don't have the stock to leave that I like. They don't have the step over values that I want. Uh, linking parameters are kind of all over the place. The arc filter is completely disabled, which makes it difficult to use the high speed toolpath. So let's do this. Let's load a default. This is my dynamic 0.4 step down with corner round arc filter. Right? This is what I like to use for this cutter. And if you look, the stock to leave, the step over, uh, quarter treatment is enabled, depth cuts is turned on to the depth that I like to use for this cutter. Everything is exactly where I want it to be, and it's the, the values that I like. So I'm not coming in saying, oh, well, the the arc filter was either too tight or too loose, um, this information is ready to go. Now, if you want to save one, you say, okay, well, that's great, but I want to save the same implement, you know, the, the same toolpath setup, but I want to use incremental instead. Just change it to what you want and hit save. You can even go grab an old project where you've got it all set up, save it out, name it whatever that, you know, toolpath is. Make sure you're naming everything intuitively so that people can get to it. These are then shared in an operations file on your hard drive and everybody can very quickly grab or you know change to a different strategy, a whole different uh, toolpath default values without having to go through every single dialogue and filling that out and, and kind of having that eagle eye inspection to make sure you didn't miss anything important. But there's one more setting that I want to use because I am trying to get you know material off of this thing as fast as possible. There's a new maximize toolpath engagement. Now this is just a checkbox. You can turn it on or off. But on this high-speed toolpath, I've kind of simplified it. So you can see a normal high-speed toolpath 
eases into the cut. And so as it moves up and down and kind of eases in, you'll see that the, the full engagement isn't reached right away, especially as it turns corners and everything else. Now this is probably perfect for you know uh, harder materials, brittle materials, but this is aluminum. I really shouldn't have any problem just basically hopping straight into the cut and going full bore. And that's what maximized toolpath engagement is going to give for us. So I've got this one, uh, and I'm going to, I've got a different one set up that I'll actually show this option enabled. But there it is under the cut parameters, maximize toolpath engagement. Here is the one that has that enabled. And look at those first four, first three passes. The first three passes, the center line on the third pass is, is over top of the part, well into the stock model. And if we compare that to the original, you'll notice the third toolpath basically is out at the edge of the stock. It takes to the fourth or fifth before we really start to get over top of that material or that uh, that part geometry. So this is, a, it's an option. Turn it on or off if you need it, but just understand what it's doing. It's just saying, don't ramp, don't take your time, get in there and get rid of this material quickly. So it's perfect for this large block of aluminum as we're starting to remove a lot of this material. So let's keep on going. I've got a finishing toolpath that I want to verify, and I want to show you the new in behavior in Mastercam 2024. So basically, in 2024, the options all are the same uh, as far as verify. So if you click a toolpath and then you just say verify, it takes whatever the default global stock is. Um, I have stock models in here uh, in my tool, you know, in my, my feature tree. So I can come in and say I want to override that stock with this other, you know, stock model or 3D geometry or whatever. And then that will verify against that, uh, which is the information, you know, it's the shape of the part at that point in the process. I don't want to have to verify all my roughing operations just to look at that one finishing one. So here's my stock model I want to verify against. If you click it first, then you, for example, shift click the toolpath you want. It's going to basically start with that stock model and use it. It's doing the override for you on the fly, so you don't have to go back into that option every time. And then it immediately goes in and loads the verification with that stock model and those toolpaths only. Very quick and easy workflow. It's, it's something that you'll want to make sure you're uh, paying attention to the order you click everything in. Um, but that uh, workflow should save you a lot of time when you're going in. Just those stock models, we'll have those intermediate stock models in there for various reasons. You could just leave them there and then very quickly verify against them. All right, so we're getting to our first sets of finishing passes, specifically on these feet. So we decided that we want to use these feet uh, in, a, in a slot, in a plate, kind of as our fixture to hold this in place. So there's my finishing tool pass. I'm going to go probe it. I've got a Simcoe probing uh, in, on this machine. I've got a probe in my, in my, uh, a probe in my tools. And we'll create a quick inspection where we say, check the diameter of this arc. Now you get to choose, just like any toolpath, you get to choose things like approach, depth. Uh, we'll just basically measure it halfway down, give us additional safety distance so that we're moving around the part and not having any problems with interference. And this right here, this is just going to quickly grab a measurement and then compare it to what I expect. If it's smaller than I expect past the tolerance, then that's a scrap part. And I'll just say, hey, the radius is too small and it'll stop. If it's too big, that's okay. I'll have it go to the same finishing operation that I just did and run it again. But it's going to be updating the tool offset as needed. And then if it's within tolerance, it just continues on the tool path or the, the machine operation. No changes needed. So here I'm going to set the remachining tolerance, uh, how much adjustment I'm allowing it, uh, things like the uh, percentage of, uh, of, of offset relative to the deviation of the measurement. But this is going to really allow my machine to stay within that tolerance zone as even as my tools wear, I'm going to be able to get a really nice 
uh, consistent uh, result. And when you post it out, it's pretty simple. It's going to create some labels. It's going to create some codes to go in and, and actually measure. And then it's got some logic in there. So it's if it's this, uh, go to the scrap. If it's this, go to remachining. And otherwise, just keep going. All right? Really helpful for uh, kind of eliminating a lot of that busy work of the machinist uh, to sit there and check on your tolerances as you go. So let's do uh, some edit common parameters. I've got the first operation done. And what I want to do is go in and make sure everything's ready to be posted. And in this case, I've got op one is a plane, a WCS plane that I used for uh, the second half of the programming. But for the first half, I was just using the top plane, right? And I realized, okay, I need to use a, a dedicated plane because I need to modify it a little bit. You can just select all those and say edit common parameters. Now that's not new, but what is new is now you have the option to change the WCS independently of the tool plane and the construction plane. So for this WCS, we'll change all of them to up one. Uh, if they were all the same, it would tell you what they were, and then you could change them to what they are. If they were different, like the top and the and the construction plane or the tool plane and the construction plane here, those are empty, but you could still change them if needed. Simple and easy, click OK, and you're off to the races. This is also really useful if maybe you're taking this part and putting it on a different machine, right? A horizontal instead of a vertical. You can quickly go in, adjust that WCS, and get up and running quickly. All right, so remember this part. We're roughing it out on the bottom here. And then we want to create a fixture that we can use to hold it. So the fixture itself is real simple. It's just these shapes right we want those in cut down into a, uh, a plate uh, and then we'll just use something to kind of clamp on to these feet uh, but that design right we're ready to do design that we don't want to have to wait for another group another user somebody else to go and design that we're going to actually just design it in mastercam and so what we did is we found these mighty mighty bite little clamps here so the height of the clamps plus the height of the feet, that's going to be where we want our plate to be. So we just uh, set a plane there, draw our, kind of the plate that we want, and we use an impression command. So the impression command just says extrude up, but don't go through the part and kind of just you know mold around it. Uh, we'll get rid of these holes with some model prep, and the basic geometry is really easy to set. For the actual clamps, those have some sketches that are available in their data sheet that says you need this flange cut to this depth, you need this through bore hole for this, and then this is where uh, the, the, the port is going to be for, the, for the, the hydraulic lines. So we've got this thing in here, and we import it, and we're just using wireframe geometry and this dynamic uh, location to just put everything where it needs to go. And we're going to then use this wireframe geometry to make those cuts. And so this is basically just CAD, right? Extrude cut down to the depths. Everything's uh, real easy to specify. Uh, if you've got the 3D model of that Mighty Byte clamp, just bring that in too. This is basically an assembly. Uh, now, it's not going to create an assembly in the same way that like a SOLIDWORKS would, where you can have kind of dynamic motion and stuff like that uh, to move things around as it goes. But everything's supposed to stay put on this anyway, so this is a perfect way to do it inside Mastercam design. So the big takeaway here is that you don't have to wait on anybody. You can go ahead and create whatever you need to create in terms of fixtures, jaws, etc., that impression command does a really nice job. And then when we go back to our main project, because we built that in context relative to the original part geometry, we can simply merge that component in with all the information and it's exactly where we need it. We're ready to roll. And then we can just program it directly here uh, and uh, we'll, we'll build it, you know, kind of right away. So that plate is going to hold it down and we feel really good about the plate itself but what we're worried about is kind of this 
I guess you would call it this archway, right? Uh, especially the engineer uh, was talking about the tolerances and specifically the chatter. There's not a lot of, of rigidity sort of this way. And so as you're machining the side of this thing, it's kind of hitting it with those flutes. There's a chance it might chatter. Now, typically, if you start to see that, you would just slow down your speed. Uh, so the flutes slow down and then you don't reach that resonant frequency. But uh, we don't really want to slow anything down. We want to go quickly. We want to get a good tolerance on this. We don't want it being flexible. So we're going to run this in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So SOLIDWORKS simulation is a tool that uh, not everybody uses or uses on a regular basis. Uh, so if you've got a tool or a command or, you know, trying to solve a problem and you're thinking, man, how do I go about, you know, solving that problem, learning what I need to know to use these tools to solve that problem. So let me show you kind of the resources we recommend in order to learn how to do certain things. So starting out, we're going to say live training is your best way to learn a new topic. So if you're starting to do multi-axis for the first time, if you're, uh, you know, in this case, you're doing some simulation, you've never done that before, that training, that interaction with the instructor is going to give you the base of knowledge that you need. You'll be able to sit there and ask questions about, okay, well, what about this? Because my parts do this. And you'll be able to get that basic understanding. For more kind of obscure projects, we try to create a lot of YouTube videos that specifically cover common challenges. So if you go into our YouTube channel, uh, and search, for example, fixture, you'll see all kinds of different uh, approaches to designing fixtures, importing fixtures, but it's just not quite what we want. Uh, sometimes, however, you know, you've got a problem and you're thinking, okay, I know there's an answer to this, right? It's not even a unique answer. It's just something I need to know. How do I install? How do I download? How do I license? How do I get to this? That information can be found on our tech guides. So on the mlc-cad.com website, go to support, drop down to tech guides, and then you find a bunch of different things here, articles listed by type. This is going to be great to send to your IT guy. But if you just kind of get to the point where you're like, I can't find anything, or I just want to talk it out with an expert, that's what we're here for. Go into MLCCAD and you can submit a case form on the web. You could give us a call. Uh, extension 2 for SOLIDWORKS. I think it's extension 3 for Mastercam. Uh, you can send us an email. You can send us a file through the website if it's too big to email. We can get remote support started. Lots of different methods to get a hold of us, but we're here, right? I mean, we're your, we're your value-added reseller, and we want you to be successful. So reach out and utilize us, and we'll steer you straight and give you the best advice we possibly can to help you get going. So for this one, we contacted support and they said, okay, you've taken the simulation class. A frequency study is super quick once you've taken that. In fact, it's almost crazy simple. So you basically create a new study, a frequency. You specify your materials. That's going to set your stiffness and your density and all that kind of stuff. Specify how it's being held, and that's it. You just run that sucker, and it's going to show you how the part is going to move. That's a little bit crazy because it's all sped up, but it's giving you the frequencies that it's going to tend to vibrate at. And if we compare those frequencies with our spindle speed, with the number of flutes, we're, we're not out of the woods, but we're also feeling pretty good. The other one I want to run is just a static study just to say, hey, if I stick a cutter on this and push against it with that cutter, how much deflection am I going to get? And in this case, the answer is about a thousandth of an inch. So not great, but also maybe not, you know, the worst. So the decision is made once we get that data that we just want to create a fixture to support this. All right, something to sit on top and clamp on top of that plate that will kind of support and hold all these ribs. Because these ribs, right, those are the stiff parts, uh, and we just want to kind of reinforce those. And so we're doing this inside SOLIDWORKS. It's a, it's a more advanced design tool. As you can see here, it's kind of a different approach to building a fixture. Instead of cutting away, I'm simply adding the features I need. I do that in the assembly, so I get it to match up perfectly. And then I go into the part and finish out the design, the details. 
uh, things like holes, right? We've got a nice database of holes we can use. Uh, I might want to add some additional features like a, a, a slot here, kind of like a drain if any coolant gets down in there. Go in and in the assembly environment, we can start adding hardware just to make sure that we're going to have access to uh, to put our, our, our tool in there, our wrench in there, make sure the, the, but, the button head screws aren't going to cause any problems. Add some fillets to kind of finalize it out and... I mean, there you go. You've got a, a pretty complicated design that's a perfect fit for this part, and it's going to provide a lot of support to it as it's being machined. Now, how do I build this? I don't want to machine that out of a, out of a solid block, right? Subtractive is not the best way to create this particular complex geometry, so we are going to print it. So before we use the SLA, the SLA printer uh, kind of uses a resin with lasers. SLS, Selective Laser Sintering, melts uh, plastic powder. So the way it works is you'll take your build chamber and get it into the machine. Uh, the material gets loaded into a material cartridge and you can mix up new and you know previously unsintered powder to kind of reuse so you're not wasting anything. But it just melts layer by layer, and then the part is sort of encased in this block of powder, and you just sort of use the sift machine. It's all, you know, kind of one integrated system. Use that machine to kind of pull it out, clean it up, and then <clears throat> this is what you get. So here is our fixture. This thing is ridiculously rigid. This is a nylon 12 material. Um, the big thing about SLS relative to SLA is that you're printing a whole bunch of parts all at once. So think of that build chamber. If you had a whole bunch of, let's say, vice jaws, uh, fixtures, you know, work supports, uh, caps, and you know, whatever it is, and you're like, okay, I don't want to print these one at a time and then take them off the machine and hit start again. I want to print a bunch of them, right? Imagine taking those parts and dumping them into a bucket dumping them into that build chamber and just sort of, you know, shaking it down so they all settle down to the bottom. You do not have any restraints in terms of how they're oriented or, you know, whether they're connected to anything else because they're going to be embedded in that powder. You can print an entire bucket of parts all in one shot. Now, it may not be like next day, right? Uh, it may not be the next day to get these done, but then if you've got a bunch of them, and fixtures tend to be something you've got a little more time on, you're going to be able to build those. CNC machines are for making money. These 3D printers are to help in that effort, right? Don't machine all of your fixtures, especially things that have complexity to them. So let's take a look at some holes on the second side. So on the second operation... Uh, we've got some holes and I want to kind of uh, pull those out of the solid model to figure out what they are and then actually turn those into tool paths. So for this I'm going to use model prep the find holes command is very quick and easy just say find all the holes and group them into a single operation where possible and then it goes through and says okay 38 holes were detected very quick and easy. Now Here's the thing. We're going to use a toolpath, a brand new toolpath called Process Hole that's going to take that solid definition directly and it's going to create the toolpath from it. But those tool definitions, those tool recognition, uh, I'm sorry, the hole recognition, isn't necessarily the exact perfect one. So if I was to go and say Process Hole on these guys, you'll see that it goes ahead and grabs them and drills them, but it drills them upside down. Because there's no way from a 3D model to know which way's up. No problem. What you can do is go cancel that, go into your solids tab, and go find that hole de definition. And this is just as if you had cut it yourself. That de hole definition is there, and you can edit the parameters, and you can do things like flip the direction, right? One simple click the button to reverse that hole, and now it's drilling from the top. If the customer gave you a size, a drill size they want, and it's like half thou off of a, a round drill size, you set your diameter to the actual drill size you're drilling it at, not the magical number that they want. You can even add top and bottom edge treatment. 
So in this case, if I go and add edge treatment, right, maybe they specified, you know, chamfer all these corners, but then they didn't actually do the chamfer in the 3D model. By modifying the feature and setting that treatment to the print, right, now you have a 3D model you can accurately machine to, save you a ton of time. But that, that solid hole definition is now perfect for the process hole toolpath. So again, process hole is just this automatic brand new toolpath in 2024 that goes through and takes that definition and says, I know how we drill those. So like this one, this is a 0.157 hole uh, in aluminum. How do we like to drill that hole? Well, we like to spot it and then peck drill it at a specific depth. And so it found that parameter based on that hole size. It created two toolpaths. It created the spot drill and the uh, the peck drill operation, and it just goes through and created them. Now, I don't have to set my retract. I don't have to set my feeds and speeds or anything like that. All that's been pulled from that operations file. So if you say, OK, well, every time we machine this, let's use these parameters to keep from breaking the drill. But if it's bigger, we'll use, you know, deeper peck uh, cycles, right? Put that into that operations manager and it just saves you all that time. It brought in some tools. Uh, this has a three quarter inch spot drill that it pulled in for the uh, spot operation. I'm just going to change the tool numbers a little bit, kind of get a little organized. And I'm expecting to use that again because we spot all of our drill holes and we've got another set of holes we need to do next. So here's this multi axis holes. These all came in as individual holes because they're all in different planes. So we're going to grab the process hole command. And before, when I grabbed it, I grabbed all of the holes of the same feature. Now, because they're separate features, I can't just grab one, right, and then have it all grab the rest. So these, these are just quarter inch holes. Just go have to go through and grab each feature because of that, that uh, nature of, of them being in different axes. But this does show you that if you had quarter inch holes kind of in various different places on the part, you'd be able to add them all in one operation very quick and easy. For the operation library, uh, just make sure that the operation library you have has that hole in it. It's basically this massive board with a hole or a plate with a hole in it where everything's defined. So there's my two operations just like before, but you can edit those just like any normal toolpath. And in this case, it says, hey, there's a three quarter inch spot drill already, but this one has another spot drill. Do you need two of them? You say, no, I don't need two. Use the one I already have and any other parameters I want to change for this particular application, I can't. For this one, it already uh, designated or indicated that it's a five axis uh, post. So it's going to create it as a five axis toolpath, uh, but I could you know, modify that if I need to. It did a good job, but the, the retracts aren't the smoothest. So we're going to go in here and add a safety zone. So with this safety zone, we'll just say that we want it to retract out past the safety zone and we'll use a spherical one, which should do a really good job with this five axis. And now all the retracts kind of go out to that distance, which I know is a safe distance, uh, kind of a spherical wrap around the part. All right, let's, let's back plot these and see where we're at. So just like before, we start with the peck, or the, the spot drill, then we do the peck. But normally what I'll do is I'll spot all the holes, then drill them. And if you look here, it switches back to the spot and then switches back to another drill. That's an extra tool change I really don't need. So let's go and take a look at what we can do about that. The process hole has sort of in, inside it two other toolpaths, and so you can't reorder them unless you explode them. So explode process hole just takes those and says, okay, now that I'm I'm you know created the way I like it, break them out into individual toolpaths so I can sort by the the uh, tool number, and now it gives me my both of my spot drills. Then it goes through and drills everything just the way I like it. So nice way to quickly and easily define the exact type of uh, uh, process that you do for that type of hole, and then just utilize it every time you encounter that same hole. 
Now let's go back in and edit one of those because I want to show you a new feature in the whole making toolpath where it shows you a graphical preview of the linking parameters. Uh, we've tre uh, done some training in, in Mastercam 2024 and the new students really, really love it. It gives you a lot more sort of visibility and understanding what's going on. If you don't like all those planes floating out there, you can just check the box or uncheck the box to turn them off. But it shows a plane, graphical plane out there for each one. It shows a whole bunch of little planes, one for each hole, so you can check and see. But like for this one, I'm going to create a, a clearance plane that's right above the, the, the top of the part, so it's a nice safe clearance uh, region. And now it's one big plane instead of a bunch of individual small planes. If you go in and look, uh, you can see that each of the, co the planes are color-coded. They're also named. So they have the name sitting on there, the top of stock, retract. In this case, it even has the depth and the tip comp that I've got turned on. And so you can clean those up and get rid of them if you don't care or if that's not something you need to see, uh, especially if you're, you've been doing this a long time. You're like, I, I know how to do my linking parameters. Then no worries, uh, but it's a nice visual ref, uh, information and it kind of gives you that data you need before having to apply it and create the toolpath and then inspect that toolpath visually. All right, so let's do some of these multi-axis finishing uh, operations. We've got a lot of faces to finish. And with the unified multi-axis toolpath, we're going to see some color coding. Uh, I'm going to show it to you on two different toolpaths, one on this inside face, and then the, the other one is going to be finishing this floor. So the color coding on the unified multi-axis does a nice job of really communicating not only to you but anybody who comes back after you to look at that toolpath communicates what's been selected and, and where so i jump in the toolpath notice that my other part features and colors are gone and now my color coding is here and that's where i've got my cut patterns the curves the machining geometry anything else in there this is just like high-speed toolpaths um, you can for example, set the start and finish curve different colors so you know which direction you're cutting from and to. Uh, I changed my strategy completely on this one from, uh, from basically side to side going up and down. I'm going to go uh, top to bottom, you know, going along this curve. And when I specify these curves, I'm going to grab these wireframe edges. That's what those dark blue lines are. And... I don't want dark blue lines or whatever color coding there is. I want to see what it is as it's defined in my toolpath. So there you go. First curve, second curve, machining geometry, all color coded. Very easy to understand what's going on. And for those of you that remember, in 2023, uh, all the, the multi-axis toolpaths were unified in one dialogue. And so this kind of takes all that complexity simplifies it and makes it very visual and easy to look at if you have a complex toolpath setup. For this one, we're just going to change it a little bit. Uh, we've got the, the, the boundary and we've got the machining surface specified, but what we want to do is turn on uh, avoidance geometry so we don't hit that wall. So for the avoidance geometries, we'll go around and pick all of these faces. Uh, this is a part that when it came in, uh, I know this is going to shock some people here, it came in with some geometry problems. And so we had to go into Mastercam uh, to try to clean some of those up. When that failed, we went into SolidWorks and cleaned some of them up. So having SolidWorks and Mastercam both uh, does a nice job. But here we go. We've got everything there. It's color-coded. We know exactly what we're going to get. And we even use that GView cube to uh, to get it into the orientation for just a quick you know overview look all right so that's the unified multi-axis toolpath we're almost there we're almost done let's deburr this real quick and for the deburr toolpath uh, we're going to go around and just deburr this top edge at first so we'll grab my uh, spherical ball end mill gotta pull <laughs> there it is um, and you can do this, you know, you can do some of this with like a contour toolpath or something like that, but on these multi-axis parts, uh, it's really handy to use the deburr. 
we're going to grab the whole part as what we want to uh, machine to, but don't, I, I don't like doing automatic because it just grabs every edge and there's just too many of them. So I'm going to go through and click uh, everything. The tangency is broken right there. So it's another thing we ended up cleaning up in uh, SolidWorks so that we can get a good clean uh, tool path. For the tool axis control, this is a five axis tool path, but we're going to leave the strategy to fixed to the main axis and we're cutting on the tip. So it's going to keep a vertical orientation fixed to the main axis. It's going to go around and cut on the tip of the cutter and we'll see what that looks like. So that looks pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And when we go through and, and back plot it, it's given us a great result, but notice it's staying vertical which isn't going to work in those later tool paths where we kind of have to reach in underneath and stuff. So we're going to say strategy is normal to contour. So normal to contour just points directly at it and goes around and machines. So it's going to be kind of peeking in at the, at the perfect angle to, uh, to reach hard to reach areas. Now, when you look at this though, do you see how the, the center line of the tool path is almost perfectly on top of the edge? And what that means is we're trying to cut with the center line of our tool, but the speed of the flute is zero at the end, right? The center line has no speed on the flute, so we want to change that to where it's not cutting on the tip. We want it to bias towards the tip, but the new option in 2024 is to avoid direct contact on the tip, tip adjacent. And so now we get a very similar result that we did before, but instead of it being, you know, cutting on the center line where it burn up or, or uh, you know, kind of basically stir weld the part, it's going to be cutting it right on the edge of that. So you see a lot of uh, enhancements, a lot of some of the things we've seen this year are relating to locating your cut on that cutter. So you can maybe adjust for and, and alternate where you cut for wear purposes or so you can get just exactly the results you're looking for. So that's a deburr. We love deburr. Save you a lot of time. Give you a really consistent look on the final part. Um, and it feels like we're done. <laughs> it feels like we're done. But uh, we, were to, we brought quality into the meeting and they said, well, we need to program the CMM. Uh, and usually we'll do that with an actual part. We'll take the first part off the line, take it over and program with it. Well, we wanted to skip a step. And so what we did is we decided, hey, we've already, through the programming of this part in Mastercam, we've already consumed this print, looked really closely at all the tolerances. We know the areas of concern, either because they're inspection points for the customer or because of how we're machining it. So let's go ahead and use uh, Mastercam, specifically Verisurf, to go through and program the CMM. And so it sits, Verisurf sits inside uh, solid or master cam uh, and if we go through to inspect these we just basically say hey create a tool path but instead of it being a cutter tool path it's a probe tool path on the CMM uh, and this information will export to whatever CMM you have and then that information is now ready to roll we haven't built our first one yet but we have our CMM uh, tool paths now one of the big benefits here is that not only do you have kind of a, a really easy to use environment to program this with, uh, but it's all coming from the same 3D model. So let's say that with this part, right, we've got uh, really thin features in here and we know this is going to be a problem, right? We went to the engineer, we said to the customer, hey, this is, this is, this is not a good design, right? This is a problem area that we've identified. Now, if you come back to an engineer and you say, hey, uh, your design is wrong, right? The first reaction is going to be, uh, you're right. Uh, I humbly accept your feedback and will modify my model direct. Well, okay, maybe not. Uh, but it's hard to really tell somebody that they have a problem with their design uh, just by pointing at it. But with a 3D model, with an actual part here, you know, ahead of time, you can go and talk about it with the realistic model. This is probably one of those where they'll look at that and say, that's not my design. And then they'll really double check their 3D model and they'll make some updates. So when they do those updates, that's going to get you a new 3D model. 
you'll bring it into Mastercam and post with all the updated geometry, uh, the new machining geometry or the machining operations, but then it'll also be able to quickly post uh, the, the CMM code without any additional steps. So I hope that this was interesting and helpful. We really wanted to do something like this where we go from start to finish and just pick up problems along the way from things like keeping track of tool wear and making sure your offsets are okay on your tools as you go through large jobs to making sure that you get really good fixtures that don't have any issues. There was a lot of different solutions here. If you have a problem and you need some help, you need some advice, you need a, a, an interesting solution uh, to how you're going to address that, give us a call, let us know these types of tools. We've got experts in all these areas and we're, we're helping people solve these problems every single day. Uh, hit us up on social media on your favorite platform, but specifically YouTube. Subscribe to YouTube. You'll see videos on all kinds of topics, including these. Um, but thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll turn it back over.